Oh, hello everybody and thanks for joining us on Sunday after it was probably a very busy night for many of you. Uh, I'm Dave Moss, I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, before we get into, direct, into introductions, I just want a uh, little housekeeping things. Um, this is a very serious <laughs> issue. Um, uh, it's not necessarily a philosophical issue for a lot of people, but an actual one that could impact your freedom, where you live, could have serious consequences for people. Uh, I would not take anything that we say up here as legal advice, uh, and we should not be uh, giving legal advice to you. Um, and further, when we get to the question portion, it's better to ask questions about what we know, what we you know, researched, what, you know, what we've seen out in the world, rather than this is my case, this is my thing, what should I do in this situation? Because that just really is a, a better conversation for you to have in a, a private setting rather than in a Sunday panel setting. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, Sounds good. So my name is Dave Moss. Uh, I am a senior investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, my focus tends to be on uh, law enforcement issues uh, and law enforcement surveillance, as well as the vendors who sell that law that technology to law enforcement. Um, many times uh, I have been dealing with issues of just general police surveillance, but lately so much of more of it has uh, had this nexus with with DHS and the panel is titled ICE, but we'll probably cover uh, various DHS branches because they're all interconnected under this overall banner. Um, it has definitely picked up interest a lot, and I'm glad that we're going to be able to uh, to address the issue of immigration. But if during the question you have questions about you know various types of police surveillance, whether it has immigration nexus or not, I'm happy to, and I think the panelists are happy to, to, to talk about the technologies themselves and how they may impact you, whether or not you're an immigrant. Um, and also, I, I would like to, you know, there are varying uh, opinions about you know, what immigration policy should look like in the United States. Um, I would just sort of say that we shouldn't really get into those debates here about, about um, how your feelings are about immigration, but I would just say that Almost all the surveillance technologies we're going to be talking about today are not technologies that are just singling out immigrants. They are collecting information on everybody. They impact everyone. Sometimes immigration enforcement is the reason they use to surveil everyone. Um, and so I would just keep that in mind you know, as we move forward. And with that, I'll just go ahead and uh, allow people to introduce themselves. Uh, uh, Kara, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I'm Kara Chappell. Uh, I have a background as a senior litigation paralegal that somehow morphed as into, excuse me, my role now as the FOIA coordinator for the city of Virginia Beach. Um, so I work in the public sector now. Uh, my name is Matthew Conley. Uh, primarily do a lot of. Uh, oh, could you go a little closer to the mic? Okay, sorry. Uh, Matthew Conley. My background is computer security, infosec, and sysadmining, but. Um, I primarily work for different agencies of the de uh, Department of Defense, and then I've done a lot of volunteering uh, with fire department, EMS. So I typically have to deal with law enforcement on multiple levels, so. and I try to help when I can. Uh, hi, my name is Blair Chintella. I've been practicing law for about 10 years now. I started off in copyright, uh, and then also got interested in these issues and started speaking at DragonCon for about six or seven years now. Um, if you talk to me after the panel, I'll give you free legal advice. <laughs> You're not leaving. I was, I was just kidding. <laughs> He's actually chained to his chair, so don't get your, your hopes up too much. Um, so the first, the first issue I want to talk about is not necessarily about any particular surveillance technology, but the data that governments collect and the controversies related to that data. So I, I am based in San Francisco, and one of the big battles over the last couple of years has been over uh, sanctuary state laws. Um, and often those things are, you know, at what point do police officers cooperate with ICE? Do they, you know, put uh, people in their custody on, in, on um, immigration detainers waiting for DHS to come and get them? Um, one of the things that has come up with various pieces of legislation is what happens to data that is collected by the government, uh, by local governments, state and local governments, and what happens when ICE wants to get access to them. And in California, there's been a battle over how, to what extent we cut off ICE's access to government data. And I was wondering, as a, as a government professional, whether that's come up or whether you have any thoughts about this issue of the data that, we're, that governments are collecting on people. Well. I think in general, uh, our, my city government isn't actively sharing. Um, if they are, we certainly haven't been made aware of it. Um, 
I know that in terms of the FOIA requests that come through there, they certainly haven't made any FOIA requests. Uh, so as, as a whole, I really can't speak to that because they aren't um, actively communicating with me. Right, but what, what I mean, are, are there particular kinds of data that, that the government is collecting? Like, I mean, you, you, you get to make decisions about what data is too private to be given out to the public, right? Or help in those decisions, or? Um, well, I don't really get to make a decision about what they get. Uh, there are laws in place right, that actually, right. you know, there's, it's pretty cut and dry, black and white. Yeah. So, uh, do you want me to expound on that? I mean, sure. Sure. There, there's information like, say, you want, you make a FOIA request for uh, 911 calls that came in. Um, there's information in those 911 calls about where the cell towers are um, that, that go out. And, you know, it's a lot of logistics. We have to go in and redact all the information about uh, these specifics on where the cell towers are. Um, it gets a little complicated in terms of going in and, and the actual data in there. Um, you have to look for it. Could I exactly tell you what it looks like? No, I know what it looks like, but I couldn't sit here and explain it to you. Oh, um, it's, a, it's okay. So uh, in terms of the data that, that we can release, uh, it, it is very cut and dry, and there are specifics of what we can and can't um, on that. Yeah, it's, it's all right. <laughs> it, it, it's a difficult subject, and yeah. so, you know. Uh, it, it, it's all spelled out and laid out very well. Um, but then there are also very <laughs> gray areas. Yeah. No, fair enough. I mean, Matthew, maybe you have some thoughts on it about the types of data that government is collecting, or you know how they store it, whether it's, you know, f you know whether they share it, or you know whether they're actually protecting it. You know, has, any, has that come up in your in your your research or line of work? In my work, it has not come up. Uh, I do have opinions based on it. You know, like for instance, I'd like there to be a time limit on how long that can be kept. I'd like to make sure it's secured. Uh, I have an issue believing in security that or that they have security considering I got nailed by the OPM hack twice and you know it's like I sat there and went hey I'm really you know I take care of everything here as much as I can and then have them release all that information that's you know a problem so I don't trust them to hold the or take security uh, uh, seriously on that on you know other people's information because it's not theirs no one takes care of anything that's not theirs you know yeah so that's my bigger concerns I like to see time limits on you know how long you can keep information you know, and like to see everything made so that uh, it's more difficult to get into okay. uh, Blair just want to give you a, a chance if you had anything to add or um. I totally agree uh, that there should be a limit on the information that's collected and how long it's kept. DHS, one of the issues that uh, came up during my research was the massive amount of like social media information that DHS is starting to collect um, on people, uh, even stuff like facial recognition, uh, information on people, and that includes citizens. That's not just people immigrating to the United States. But um, specifically regarding people who are trying to immigrate, um, one common question they're now asking, and I know the EFF has done some work on this as well, um, is, you know, you can give us all your email addresses and social media information that you've accessed or used in the last five years. And then they sort of build like a dossier on you, and I think it's called the A-file, which stands for alien file. Um, and there's like no limitation on how long they can keep that. So they're essentially creating, you know, violating people's privacy, uh, even if they get citizenship, there's nothing to say they can't just keep that forever. So, I mean, there definitely needs to be reasonable um, time limits on that, uh, as well as do we, do we really need to scrutinize people's political beliefs when they're you know immigrating to the United States? Do we really need facial pictures, uh, pictures of people's faces, citizens, non-citizens or whatnot at airports? Um, so I think there are real important questions with that. Well, well, let's talk a little bit about that, about, about airports. With regard to uh, uh, the social media collection, um, earlier this year, the State Department had put out two notices on the Federal Register you know, about this idea of them collecting social media from uh, visa applicants. And this is both immigrant visa applicants as well as non-immigrants, you know, visitors. And they were asking for your account identifiers, your handles, 
you know, anything you've used in the past, anything you've used, you're using now, that'd be your Facebook, your Twitter, and your Instagram. Um, and they want to do it like as as uh, Blair said, they do want to keep this for five years. Um, and I'm certainly concerned about this. I know that if I was leaving the country, going someplace else, I don't want to hand over that stuff. That is. Some of my, my handles out there are not ones that are necessarily easily identifiable with me. They're for various, like, non-nefarious purposes, but I just, they're just not my public thing. Um, and, you know, I am definitely concerned about that being used on people who are coming into our country because I don't want it to happen to me going out to another country as well. Um, has, has anybody had any experiences, you know, related to this or, or thoughts on it? Or? No, but what's their justification for five years? Although I think, oh, well, they, so they, well, the way I understood is that they ask you, what have you used in the last five years? They don't just hold on to it for five years. It's just like, in the last five years, what all social media have you used? Then there's no limit on how long they can keep that. Right. So, yeah. so I don't know the five, who decides the five year, you no, know, five, seven, five years, six months, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and with regards to things like biometric collection, and that's really ramping up. Uh, at our airports, and the Atlanta airport was one of the, the early test sites over the last couple of years for face recognition and other biometric uh, 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 issues. Um, Blair, do you want to talk about some of the, the issues? You've done some research on the face recognition? Oh. No, not, not in the facial too much. Oh, not so much <laughs> on the facial. Um, has anybody had any experience with face recognition or? or no? No? Really. All right, I will, I will talk a little bit about face recognition. So. Uh, there's various ways that the, uh, the the government has face recognition technology. Some of it is just working off the existing surveillance cameras that there are. Um, there are often uh, handheld devices that uh, law enforcement will use. Um, one of the 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 things that I've been researching is a a pilot program in San Diego County, which is the you know border region of California, um, in which DHS had funded. Um, these what are essentially just mobile phones with a app that uh, you could take a picture of somebody and it would send it to the system and then match it to mugshot records. Um, and we had gotten a hold of through a, a Freedom of Information Act request a um, sort of uh, report on how the pilot project was going. And one of the cases came, you know, one of the testimonials from ICE was how they had gone to one house to do some sort of immigration check. There was a guy next door who set their spidey senses tingling, um, and so they took him into custody and they used facial recognition to match him to a mugshot database. And to me, it was a little bit a little bit weird to have spidey sense be the reason to run somebody through a system like that. Um, has anybody? I, I mean, have, have any of you actually had facial recognition used on you or anything like that? Has anybody ever had an encounter with that? Uh, I guarantee it's been used on me a Probably. billion times. Right, but, but beyond like Facebook face recognition, has anybody been at an airport and found themselves in front of a terminal or something that's doing some sort of facial recognition? A few over here. If you don't want to raise your hands, that's fine. I'll, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, but it's not just uh, faces. It is fingerprints. There, we are seeing the growth of iris scans. Um, we've definitely been doing research at EFF into tattoo recognition as being something that's used, um, particularly with immigrants. Cool. Um, that I technology my head. That would be nice to know. Yeah. Th that technology is very, very, very unreliable, but they're very interested in it nonetheless. Um, How would we know if they're checking out our face for a recognition program? Good question. So sometimes there will be a disclosure that allows you to opt in or opt out, at least during these pilot phase. So I would keep an eye out for those signs and not just ignore them um, because you may have an opportunity. Like you may not know if you missed the sign. Um, certainly if there's a police officer who asks to take a picture of you with his phone, you should say no. Um, a lot of people don't know that they can say no to police with things like that, but sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Um, you know, we've seen you know, at least police departments, you know, deploying face recognition in totally untransparent ways that you only find about find out about uh, through doing public records requests and kind of doing battleship, like, you know, do you have this record for this technology? And they're like, no, we don't. And then the next one's like, oh, yeah, we do. Uh, and, or like go fish or things like that. Or if you're always the one that gets pulled over for that special screening, that might be a clue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about, about license plate readers. Um, oh, I got an experience on that. Right. So, so here I was familiar with the, uh, the technology known as license plate readers. Awesome. So I'll just do a quick one, two, three on what these are for those of you who don't. Um, these are, is a pretty simple technology. They are cameras that 
take the backs, uh, pictures of the backs of cars or sometimes the front of cars, recognize that A, there is a license plate, then captures the license plate, takes the letters and numbers and makes them machine readable, attaches the time and the date, and then uploads it to a database. And these cameras that do this are often attached to fixed locations like um, street lights, highway overpasses. Uh, they're also often attached to police cars. And so those police cars are able to canvas neighborhoods and collect data as they go. A lot of times it's law enforcement. A lot of times it's also private companies who are hiring uh, or contracting with uh, repossession companies or tow trucks and that they're also going around and collecting it. Um, and the reason this is so, one of the reasons this is so nefarious is that uh, it allows you to do historical research of what, where people have been. They collect the data with the assumption that maybe you didn't create do a crime today, but maybe you'll do a, a crime two years from now, and then we can go back and look at everywhere you've been. Um, or maybe during a police stop, they just run your numbers to see where you've been. Um, or maybe they want to track you in real time. All they have to do is add your license plate, and then every time your car is seen by a vehicle, uh, it knows where you are. Um, also, you can, and sorry if I'm going on a little too long, I feel like there's a need for a little bit of a primer here. Um, uh, you can also put in the address of a location and see what vehicles have been seen in the vicinity of that. And as a final sort of thing, you can also use it to figure out what cars have been seen next to other cars to create social networks of people. So you can imagine how in the hands of uh, a, say, an entity that is wanting to you know, go after an immigrant population, putting in the address of a healthcare center that is known to give services to undocumented uh, immigrants, you could just put in that address and then find all the cars that have been there. And then you can find out what cars have been seen next to those cars to map out an entire network. Um, we, we know that uh, CBP puts up their own trailers all over the place, as well as subscribes to some of these databases collected by commercial entities. Um, ICE has also contracted to get access to this database of stuff collected by these private companies. Um, and we're not fully sure how they're using it. We're not sure necessarily where they're doing it. And we wouldn't necessarily know what the impact is because a lot of the stuff doesn't make it into the case files. And often, like, immigration proceedings are really covert. Matthew, you got thoughts on it? Um, El Tadina, California, the uh, police cars there happen to have the scanners. And to be honest, on the technology side, it's really impressive when you think, well, this thing took a picture, you know, the car passed me, took a picture of my license plate, pulled up, and was able to pull up that time I wasn't aware of it. I had a uh, bench warrant for my arrest because I missed a court date that I wasn't aware of. Uh, I had moved from California to back to Georgia, and then a few years later moved back to California for a bit, and I was only in town for a couple of days when this happened. And I was impressed with the technology perspective-wise, but it also scared the bejesus out of me because I'm sitting here going, wow, you know, you, you know hunt, it, they showed me how it works in their cars and the fact that when they had passed me, it took a picture and then you know, looked through the database and flagged that my license plate happened to have a warrant attached to it. Uh, all the paperwork to that's already been taken care of. It's been six, seven years. Well, it was 2011 when this happened. And it was interesting, but yeah, it was really creepy perspective-wise to go, wow, you can do that while you just pass me? How many you know, other issues could you have? My license plate being hacker could be an issue with that, but yeah. <laughs> um, so with license plate readers, one of the issues that are coming up, and this is a FOIA question, so hopefully you can help me out here. Uh, one of the, the issues that is coming up in various um, states is to what extent data collected by these license plate readers is available to the public through a public records request. So for example, um, with the uh, city of Oakland, we put in a public records request and they gave for one week's worth of data and they gave us the raw data. They gave us all the plates, all the locations, all the time and dates. Um, other places have said no. Georgia recently passed a law this year uh, saying that those are not accessible through the Public Records Act. Um, although I do know that there are people who have attained date, this raw data from many Georgia jurisdictions uh, before the law went into effect. Um, are, are there a lot of folks from Georgia in here? Just imagine so. Um, Georgia is one of the most covered license plate raider states. There is some vendor uh, that came into Georgia and went everywhere. I mean, we're talking like 
population of like 300 people has access to license plate readers here. It's all over the place. What's that? <laughs> oh, wow. I, I'm going I'm to look it up. I'm going to look it up. And if, if folks want to grab me, a, we have a booth. I can actually look up some of your Georgia jurisdictions. Um, but with, with you know, if, if that kind of request came into your office, how would you treat that? Well, okay. So I'm from Virginia. Uh, and to my office, I believe that they would treat that information as not publicly accessible because those plates are tied to private information. So I think they would say no, like some of those other states did. Yeah. And would you release it, though, if you just removed the plates? Like, would you, is there a way to do it where you would redact all the plates and just have the location, time, and you would know any particular vehicle? Is there, is there a level that you might release it at? I think it's possible that we could review it and release the vehicle types, maybe the years and the locations, mm -hmm. times. That might be something that could be considered, sure. Okay. Um, uh, Blair, I don't know if you, you've thought about the, the legal side of this, but one of the things that, that we often hear is that this is too private to be released to the public, but it's not private enough that we need to get a warrant well, to collect gonna, it. That's what I was going to say. Is like it's a Supreme Court precedent that basically says you don't have a right or you don't have – the police don't have to get a warrant based upon probable cause if you're in like a public area. So if you're in a park and you're giving a speech or that's like a stereotypical example, uh, then the police do not need a warrant to conduct surveillance. Um, but at the same time, your license plate is in public and it's by law required to be in public. Um, so I don't see how that, that argument stands up. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court, I guess, has recently held that data in the aggregate is treated differently. So maybe not just like your license plate for a day, you know, records of that, but over a month or a year or whatever, it will show your path. And so that's been a, like a reoccurring or fairly new, relatively new theme in Supreme Court cases um, is that, you know, it shows that you, you know, customarily leave, live, leave here at a certain time or you go to these certain spots, whether it be a hospital or a church or wherever, and over that, period of time, it builds like a pattern of your life, essentially. And so in a recent case, fairly recent case, Supreme Court has said that a warrant is required in that case. Now, it's not to say that they can't ever get it. They just have to prove probable cause in a warrant. And that's Otherwise, they can just get it pretty much unfettered, except for the Historic Communications Act would be a one additional requirement, but um, I won't go into that really right now. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, you know, in, a, in an immigration context, one of the things I find fascinating about license plate readers politically is that we have often found that, um, you know, some of the, the more libertarian Republican uh, 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 officials out there and uh, people who work in that space are very, very upset about license plate readers. And one of the things that's fascinating is that the case that gets them really riled up was an actual uh, Customs and, and Border Protection uh, deployment of license plate readers where they put a license plate reader outside of a gun show in Carlsbad, California. And, um, you know, if it, it raises all sorts of issues, like, and, and, you know, I think that after that happened, we heard from like Rand Paul, we had a, uh, a, a state senator in, in California introduce legislation about license plate readers because you know, uh, while these, these politicians may have a hardline stance on immigration, they weren't willing to sacrifice their privacy and the First Amendment right to be interested in Second Amendment rights for that issue. And I, I, I found that really fascinating. And it is one of these things where we have um, a kind of consensus for both parties that there is a problem here. Um, uh, I think, Blair, you wanted to talk about the the sort of border zone issues. You want to you want to explain a little bit about about you know how things might change in in border regions. Um, yeah, I, I I passed around a couple handouts. Um, one is the there's basically a law and supporting regulations that say the border patrol has certain authorities within a hundred miles of the border. So you can see with that picture there, it basically engulfs all of Florida. So <laughs> there are limited protections in Florida, but you know, in, in preparing for the panel, I was just fascinated by all the technology, and maybe Matthew knows a lot about that because he actually works on those systems, I understand. Mm -hmm. um, I had in the past. You had in the past? Yeah. Not currently, no. so don't hold it against him. But, um, 
but it's just amazing that the amount of stuff they have down there, like fixed towers, they have ground sensors that are just laying on the ground. It's all integrated on the border, and it's within this zone, this 100-mile zone. It doesn't have to be right at the border. So, you know, there are people living in that zone. It turns out it's around, like, two-thirds of the population. So, uh, it's all, and they have drones flying over, and, and DHS, uh, their, you know, Customs and Border Patrol, they're asking for more and more surveillance down there. It's all integrated. It goes back to a command center. And so, you know, people da living down there are kind of subject to this you know, ever-present surveillance. Um, but maybe Matthew could talk about, I don't know, talk about that. But <laughs> I, I can talk about drones. I researched a little long drones. Yeah. So, so, so some of the things we're, com we're seeing coming out that are being proposed to uh, uh, monitor the border, definitely an increase in drones. Uh, CBP has been pretty infamous for having, you know, fairly military-grade predator drones flying over the border, which not only do they use, but they will lend them to local police departments, you know, for other purposes as well. But there are ground sensors. We've seen uh, a lot of acquisitions of technology called direction finders, which, you know, to say very simply, are devices that maybe hear a radio signal out there or a cell phone signal or, or something out there and are able to pinpoint maybe which direction it's coming from. So, you know, if somebody's, you know, crossing over the border, maybe they're able to go, uh, to go and look at them. Um, did you ask a lot about technology? Uh, um, one, one of the things that made me laugh a moment ago here is um, I always get slightly intrigued by a lot of the technology because I know that at one point it will be retired and sent to auction. And I will go hunt down the auction and go, hey, I can buy a drone. Sweet. I can buy, you know, the ground center. I, I mean, there's police-grade license plate readers that you can just buy off eBay. Yeah. Probably. Well, I, I don't mean like eBay. I was mean like, for instance, uh, GovDeals.com happened to be a auction site specifically for uh, police and uh, fire and different governments throughout the country. Yeah. And you can buy a lot of government uh, surplus equipment that way. And there's other sites as well, but yeah. And, and, and another, you know, one of the controversies playing out around the country is, uh, you know, this issue of real ID and having a uh, driver's license that have RFID chips in them. And one of the utilities for uh, the DHS agencies is they'll say on one end, oh, well, then this is going to make border crossing easier. Like, you know, we'll be able to, you know, as you're pulling up, you know, 100 feet from our little stop, our computer will see that you're there and it'll bring up your file and then you get to like breeze through when you come up. Um, and there is maybe a certain amount of convenience there. Again, you have now put something in your pocket that can be read from, you know, dozens of feet away. And that is a, a huge, a huge privacy trade-off. Yeah, but you can do that with your credit card as well, so. That is true, <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna start opening up to questions if that's okay with you folks. Um, and we'll see, we'll see how many questions we got, and then we can cover some, some other points. There's, there's been several comments about uh, time limitations. I guess I've gotten to the point where I assume that everything is going to be kept forever, and I don't know how you could ever have a time limitation. I mean, you say five years, yes. Can it possibly really go away? Um, with extent of license plate readers, we have seen states putting laws in place to limit at least what government entities can hold on to. So in California, the California Highway Patrol is only able to hold on to it for what I believe it's, it's 60 days. Um, some states have said, okay, well, it's two years. Some will say it's like six months. And I mean, they have to do it. Like if they don't do it and you find out they haven't, you know, people could sue them over it or they can even get into maybe like criminal problems over it. So. You don't think there's a hard disk sitting in the closet somewhere from six years ago? Possibly. I would love to hear about that. It's, if there is <laughs> any government a, a, police workers who know that their that. department <laughs> is violating the law, like I, I'd certainly be interested in hearing about it. Um, but no, I certainly think that there are law enforcement agencies that are acting irresponsibly who will say they've purged something and then they haven't, or maybe there's some backups somewhere. Um, but I think it's on to... Uh, you know, us to hold them accountable, and actually, if it's not us personally, like I, I'm in a position of, of of some authority in that I have, you know, like you know, 17 lawyers who can back me up on something. Um, but nevertheless, there are elected officials who should be standing up for you, and it's going to vary depending on where you are. But the good thing is that it is a kind of bipartisan concern with that sort of thing. If I could piggyback on that real quick, I mean, one of the I think an equal concern is how securely it's held. Because yeah, if it's if you're gonna say yeah, 
I mean, if it's hacked or it's, I mean, how many, how many here have heard of a data breach in the last two years? <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough said. Um, I'll put a perspective here. Um, volunteer firefighters, I've taken a bunch of classes in the past you know, five years. And I've taken classes at fire departments that may be attached to a uh, police station. And you go, oh, cool, what's the Wi-Fi password so I can take my test? And it'll be a name of either something in the building, something on the building, the ad, you know address, uh, station number, etc., or the year it was founded. Oh, cool! All right. Then you realize that's the admin password the, to the wireless router, and it's the admin password to all the routers. And all of a sudden, I'm going, "Hey, I can get onto your police network from here. I shouldn't be able to do that." <laughs> We, we've seen similar problems yeah. with license plate readers where yeah. uh, a couple of years ago we were doing, you know, me and one of our computer scientists were doing some research and we had discovered that there were, you know, like dozens and dozens of license plate readers in Louisiana um, that were just attached to the internet and you could access them through oh, a URL with no <laughs> encryption, no password required. You, you went to a URL and you were given the controls to the device. Sure. And then if you clicked a button, you could open up the camera window, see it live, and things coming down. And at DEF CON, the recent uh, hacker convention in Vegas, there was a whole panel about uh, body camera vulnerabilities. And we, had, you know, I was in F DEF CON, but I heard about it and I had the, the, the researcher come speak to us. Um, and it was frightening. It was frightening. Not only could you, like, uh, some of these cameras, you could actually get into the camera, Take video off it, change it, and get the video back onto the camera. <laughs> well, yeah, you see, so you were at it. Yeah, it was, it was frightening. It was frightening, and that each of these cameras was actually a portal. Some of them were actually a portal into the entire network. Like once wow, you. Wow, I didn't even yeah. know that. Yeah, it, it, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. For the record, she has a DefCon hat on. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> we get the box to the next person right behind you, maybe. I was one. Uh, so one of the things I, I, I thought that the EFF did, which was awesome, was uh, this thing called Surveillance Self-Defense. I think it's ssd.eff.org. And I was wondering if you guys had something equivalent uh, for physical surveillance. You know, what are our rights, you know, for, for, for the common person, what are our rights? You know, what do we have, like, uh, for example, I went and took uh, a standardized test for certification. And in that test, they require you to give you to give uh, Prometrix uh, your fingerprint, and they say it's because um, you know they want to be able to identify you when you know, take breaks and come back in, so somebody else isn't taking the test for you. But at the same time, they're storing your fingerprint. So how do you know how do, how do common people know how to you know say hey no you're not taking can't take my fingerprint or you know yeah it's rough um i mean oftentimes they will hand you a piece of paper and if you actually read it there will be an opt-out process in it um you know like in a similarly like you can not go through the scanner at the airport if you're willing to get a pat down um you know we have people on staff who are very proud that they've been traveling for 10 years and have never gone through a tsa scanner um so it i think it is kind of like that um i mean to sort of add on to your 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 question about what you know resources we have uh, surveillance self-defense is a, a section of our website that tells you all sorts about how to protect your computer. Um, but we also did recently put out a, uh, a border search guide, and a, the, which is, you know, when you're crossing the border, regardless of whether you're an immigrant or you're a U.S. citizen, whatever, you might find yourself being asked to hand over your device or being demanded that they search your device. And we actually have um, a, both a pocket guide for you to take with you, as well as a, a deeper dive into what your rights are uh, when you go down there, what things you need to take care of, what things you might do in advance, whether it's like encrypt your device, leave certain devices at home, make sure your 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 you know you know if you're doing thumbprint identification on your phone, you deactivate that before you go across the border, all sorts of things like that. Um, and it, yeah, it's it, it it's all on our website, so that that could be useful. I think did you have a question somewhere over here? Yes. That, It's soft, so you can throw it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh you, well, and it doesn't hurt if you get hit with it. I know that <laughs> for sure. So um, I'm interested in the sensors that you were talking about in the border zones. Um, I know, you know, from just basic knowledge on cartoons, there may be motion sensors or um, infrared, something like that. What are some of the other different types that there might be? 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> they have, and Matt, you could probably chime in whenever. Do you, uh, while he's, he's doing worked that, do you on these systems. Backwards to this gentleman, the right? There is integrated fixed tower, which yeah. is long range, big <laughs> towers. There's remote video surveillance system. It's mounted on like, you know, tripods. Um, all this links back to like a centralized control room. There's what they call unattended ground sensors. So these are short range, they detect seismic, infrared, acoustic, contact, magnetic um, imaging sensors, which are a specific type of ground sensor. Um, they, a they lot of these video. look like a portable uh, cell phone tower. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, they have mobile systems, of course, stuff you mount on, on vehicles, stuff that agents carry. Um, those are just the land base, and so they kind of break them up into land based versus air. Um, and like we discussed, they have drones essentially, uh, helicopters, planes, and that, that sheet I passed around shows all of those. Um, I mean, from a, and from a legal perspective, you kind of get in the situation of, you know, as these technologies advance, as they, have, as they have thermal imaging and stuff like that, you start to run into some constitutional problems. You know, if you can start seeing through walls, seeing through people's homes, as the drone flies over and takes pictures of 7,000 mile border or whatever it is, then you have some serious constitutional issues. And you know, as of right now, they, there's just a few Supreme Court cases that say, you know, you do have an expectation of privacy, like the police can't jump hop over your fence. But there's a Supreme Court precedent that says, you know, if the helicopter is 400 feet above your house, it's okay for them to look through the cracks in your greenhouse. There's a case involving mar where they discovered marijuana. Mm. That doesn't require a warrant. Or if they're just a thousand feet above your house, and the court kind of reasons that, well, they're still within the regulations, and so that's like the public airway, and they know people who have their property know and should expect that people are going to be traveling in the public airway. But how many people do you know fly helicopters? You know how many? <laughs> but then again, you have now now you have small drones, so it's becoming more common. So there's a constant sort of interplay as far as that's concerned. And all that, I guess, to tie back to your question, is, is coming into play down the border, which because of this 100-mile buffer zone has been deemed to have less constitutional protection because that's per statute and regulation. And there's a long constitutional history of you know, the Supreme Court upholding additional powers for the government near the border. And there's, you know, like I said, there's two thirds of people living within that 100 mile buffer. So I just always realized that the 100 miles, how far they were getting inland, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it doesn't get, if you go further west on uh, Interstate 10, you see all kinds of stuff on Interstate 10, mm -hmm. especially about San Diego. Mm -hmm. There's like more, there's more, more work for guys there than our cops. I mean, you can throw a rock and get five work for guys. And I'll say, and like, yeah, the, day, the ACLU deems it or dubs it a uh, constitution free zone. But that's not quite accurate. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're going to keep moving along. So, so yeah, no, I see you. So I just want to, I want to get some process going, get people on stack. So after you do it, there's a woman with glasses right here with her hand up, and it's going to go to her. And then there's, so there's a guy in the very back whose hand is going to get really sore, and it's going to go to him next. And then the the pink hair right in front of him after that. Does that work? And then we'll move over to this side. I see you over there. Okay, uh, please. Okay, so. Um, you guys brought up the uh, the immigration service running ALPR at the California Gun Show, um, and as someone who has been or in heavily involved with a 501c4 here in Atlanta, focuses on civil rights. The immediate question that pops into my head is, EFF, have you gone after them yet with a Title 18 lawsuit for deprivation of civil rights? If they are, you know, in this particular culture where both the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court has shown extremely uh, pro Second Amendment uh, leanings, and then, and then our last Supreme Court slapped the FBI so extremely hard on warrantless tracing of people with GPS sensors. It just seems like an absolute opportune time to, since they're violating, you know, clearly the Second Amendment and chilling the First Amendment, to go after them hard with a federal lawsuit. So this is not going to be a satisfying answer for you. And the reason it is is because I am not a lawyer at EFF, and so I have to be very careful what I say about both our existing litiga litigation and litigation that we may file. And so I don't, I don't, I don't want to overpromise or underpromise for you, but I mean, I can, I can tell you that we, 
just won a giant case in the Supreme Court of California over getting transparency with 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 automated license plate reader data. And so, generally, things how you know work for us is you know you know, you got to know what's going on first, and then you can do something later. And so we're kind of that is our main license plate reader litigation around that. And we also have legislation going on and these examples. Oftentimes, like, you know, court process, we've had, like, lawsuits from the NSA going on, like, more than a decade now. And that's not going to, like, it's going to be like, oh, well, EFF sued over X. Well, you know, maybe we'll get a solution to that in 15 years, you know. Um, sometimes using these examples like that are much stronger for getting legislative change instead of change through litigation. Sometimes it's one or the other. There have been some recent court cases recently related to tracking of people that may bode well for something. Um, you know, certainly we've been looking at various state laws. Right now the ACLU is challenging, I believe in Virginia, I believe they have a lawsuit in Virginia over, because um, you, you have a pretty good data privacy law in Virginia, I believe, and they are suing, they tried to get legislation passed on license plate readers and they said, if you don't pass it, our next stage is litigation. They didn't pass it, now they're suing, and that actually has moved all this way up the court. Have you passed it backwards yet? No. Does anybody have anything to, 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 I mean, I guess he was asking a question about EFF litigation, which none of you are experts on, I'm afraid. No, but I'll check on that on the lawsuit and I'll, get back to you. Cool. So I wanted to go back to facial recognition. Could you talk a little louder? Yes. Uh, um, I wanted to go back to the issue of facial recognition because this is a technology that is flawed. It's especially flawed for people of color and it's being used as if it's not flawed. And my concerns are is that when it's fine, no, when it works, it's one argument, but what happens when it misidentifies someone and it ends in a tragedy and then everyone's apologizing later and wow, who knew this was coming when you should have known it was coming, <laughs> so. I, I, oh, oh, sorry, just, just to, to provide some context around that, there have been many studies showing that the technology as it exists now um, has a much higher rate uh, when it is uh, trying to match both uh, uh, people of color and women. Um, and it's just much worse on that. And on top of that, like exacerbating that problem is that because of the imbalance in uh, incarceration and arrests in our country, there are data sets that have you know a disproportionate amount of people of color in those databases. So there's both a, uh, a technolo technological error rate that's a problem as well as an actual data source bias into it. And we are seeing uh, police departments across the country having vendors come to them and say, We've got magic here. We've got magic. You want magic? We can give you a discount on it. Um, and they'll be like, that's great. And, you know, they'll start employing it before they've written policies for it, before they've really, like, figured out whether it's a good deal and it's whether it's what the community needs. And I think that's kind of what, what, uh, what you're getting to. Um, we're kind of back on face recognition. Do you have folks have thoughts well, on that? Well, it's more of a general thought, and it's not a happy answer. But if there is like just in general errors in this technology, like if you're pulled aside or if you're identified and you know subject to extra screening and they don't find anything, it's not like you can just turn around and sue the government for you know false imprisonment. Uh, the government has immunity um, from the, those kinds of lawsuits for the most part. And basically your only recourse is if there was something to get it excluded at trial. So if you don't have anything that they find or they, you know, there's nothing there for them to take, they just let you go on your way and you can't really get any satisfaction. Um, but you know, if you could exclude the evidence at trial, that's where the recourse for these types of violations. And you know, unfortunately, there needs to be civil laws, but again, the government has this sovereign immunity for that, almost all of its actions. So, so I, I think the one thing I would say is that um, if you pick up the newspaper one day and there's headline so-and-so police department is looking at implementing facial recognition get on the phone and call your city council member your board of supervisor and be like hold up more research before you're actually going to do more um, I, mean, I mean this is going to be a serious problem we talked about license plate readers tracking you the I fight so hard on license plate readers and I don't even own a car but I fight so hard on it because I know that the next step is going to be instead of tracking you based on your license plate is going to be tracking you based on your face as long as soon as they get more better and better technology to do it in real time and they're able to put that in a data system it will be very difficult to go out in public without having your whereabouts look you know um, recorded when you say city council uh, other if you're um, you know say if you understand technology and you live in a 
a slightly smaller town than Atlanta. Uh, you can typically go to your local police departments and such, and it, you know at least, you know here's my concerns. You know, because a lot of times here, I've noticed in smaller governments and such, smaller towns, is that there's no expertise in anything. So they're going strictly by what the vendor says. Oh, the vendor says, you know, our community just got their first CAD system, computer aid dispatch. It's 2018. They just got a dispatch. How were they doing it before? Uh, Just writing it down. They'd type it in, but nothing was automated. We're, we're in a population of, eh, it's like 30,000 people in the county. So, I mean, it's big enough. It's a lot of paper. Um, I mean, faxing reports back and forth. But it's the fact that no one knew how to do it. No one knew how to do anything. You know, even at the fire department I was at, no one knew technology well enough to really integrate, you know, technology into the department. And Has so the thing been passed all the way to the back yet? Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Sorry, yeah. I didn't interrupt you. What I'm just saying is that if you have some you know, skills or knowledge in this, be willing to share it with your community as a whole in general, whether it's, you know, your local law enforcement and such, to go, hey, before you do that, you know, they're selling you BS, you know, they, it's not magic, it, they can't do this and it'll screw up here, keep that correlation. A lot, a lot of it's going to be, is gonna, that's going to be important because when we're talking about like the law and the constitution, that's like the baseline. So that's not to say, I mean, states could pass laws affording more protection. But the, the the law I'm referring to is the baselines, and you, you can't go below this no matter what. And there there are states where their constitutions afford more protections against searches and seizures and that kind of thing. So that's why it's still important to go out there, you know, not just rely on a good Supreme Court case. You know, go out there and, and talk to your representatives and push for good laws, regulations, rules, and whatnot. Yeah, get involved. And I'm expertise in IT security, so I actually ran for a local office this year on the basis of, you know, like, eh, what, what worse could I do? And I still got 33% of the vote, and I didn't advertise at all. I'm really happy with those results. Uh, in our county, though, uh, well, I'm an outsider, so it's a small area. Or sm- uh-huh. so the fact that I'm an outsider and I got that much of vote, that's impressive. Well, oh, hold on, let's 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 let's, let's get back on top. I feel like we're okay. straying a little bit Sorry. here. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, Cara, um, uh, do you do you work with pl- with FOIA requests for for police officers, police related things like you know our our policies related to face recognition by your police department? Is that something that I can get? I don't work with directly with those. Okay. No. So. All right. So way out of the way in the back there. Okay. So I think there needs to be a distinction made between law enforcement collection of information and, and military grade collection of information. A couple of years ago, I think there was a a, a a case where the DEA or the D, or Homeland Security was sharing information with law enforcement to reconstruct. Hey, if you stop this guy at this time, you might find some drugs, kind of thing. Um, what type of laws and uh, or even litigation options are available to stop transfer from military assets to law enforcement? From 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 okay, so uh, I can't I can't speak to like the sort of litigation side of things. I'm just gonna try to avoid it to keep things clean. Um, uh, legislatively, one of the bills that we've been working on in California until you know recently, and now we're having to reevaluate because it was amended at the last minute, uh, is a bill to um, require. Uh, oversight and approval of transfers of military technology to local police departments. Is that not what you're talking about? Military information. He's military about information. Actual information. Uh, for instance, so, sorry, I misunderstood. Person, What's you know, that? Like, uh, you know, we have this information on this person, Intel, yeah. okay. and to transfer to you know from government to local is what he was saying. Right. Like if you use a warrantless search with a drone yeah. because it's a military collection for national defense. When can you trans? It, sh- it shouldn't be possible to transfer that to a law enforcement agency that needs a warrant to get that information. I- I'm asking what 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 strategies, tactics, or efforts are being put toward that? Yeah, I, I I'm just going to be honest and just like I don't want to give bad information or guess, but I, I I think your concern here is like really really well noted, um, and I think that it is it is something worth worrying about and looking into more. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I, there were, some of these answers are not going to be super satisfying, but I really do appreciate you raising that as. A issue that we should all be mindful of. Uh, did you hand it forward already? Yeah. Perfect. 
Would you say that sanctuary cities are handling the collection of data differently than non-sanctuary cities for immigrants? I think they're trying to. I, I think that, that sometimes there is um, uh, a, a, um, a left-hand, right-hand thing between you know what the city council says and what police departments maybe are doing. Um, I, th I think they are. I think they're actually trying to, and they're very mindful that uh, the data is the is the uh, is often the key um, for uh, for immigration officials. Um, one of the more interesting things, and this may not may not be related to your point or not, but um, in San Francisco where we are, um, the the city had a vote to uh, say that you could vote in a city council election. Um, if your kids, not a city council, in a school board election, if your kids are in the school, regardless of your immigration status, regardless of your citizenship status. So the idea is that immigrants can vote in a school board election. And obviously, this is a very like San Francisco y thing, but we had one voter registration because uh, every, you know, immigrants were worried that if they registered to vote, this would put them on a list. This would be information that was accessible by, you know, ICE and other other agencies. And so this experiment ended up being a very failed experiment because of this fear and this inability that even if San Francisco collected this data, voter rolls are still often very much public records to an extent they can be obtained. Sure, but do you have the box still? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that um, there are groups that are doing fairly innovative ways to, to go about that. Um, the, one of the main companies that does license plate readers, there was a, uh, a, a, a large group of immigrants did protest at the facility, but I thought it was really interesting that they did intentionally did not invite the media to it because uh, for that very reason. They wanted to, I mean, because they could shoot their own photos, they could do it in a way that would control it, and also just the fact of being there has an impact on the company. And so I think that was that was a fairly, uh, I mean, we won't necessarily know what the effect was, but to me, I thought that was a fairly effective thing. I think that, um, you know, even if it's not like a direct let's affect policy, I think that um, uh, taking those communities and passing on the information about how to protect yourselves can be really, really uh, powerful. And I think that it's hard to move forward and affect change without first like it, it's hard to go on the offense before you've really solidified your defense yeah. Thank you. just want to yeah. see and if there's any thoughts my curiosity here is because you've dealt with this here on that is um is there like a different ballot per se to so if someone's voting for a you know a school you know board item you know, in our area, typically, if you're voting for you know school board, you're doing it while you're voting for your other people. And yes, I actually care whether or not it's a citizen that's voting for a U.S. you know, or even a government within a you know the United States. Uh, you know, so is there a way to keep it separate? So, for instance, they're only voting on the item for the. Well, I mean, I I'm not really sure how it's panned out, and I'm not sure how much effort they put into it okay. for a single person, um, <laughs> like a single voter. I, who mean, I don't even think. I don't even think. Yeah. Mean, so. um, I mean, I imagine they they would. I'm not really, you know, fully, you know, okay, engaged in that that sort of issue in San Francisco. Okay. Um, did the mic move up this way? We we got five minutes left, so let's let you know. We have a few more people with questions. I think we had some up. Can, I think I saw some people up here who had had a question. Is that right? If not, we'll go back to this. This. Oh wait. The way this guy in the blue shirt. Oh. Where the mic is. Well, I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna go for it. I just wanted to figure out where we're going next. All right. Uh, so I work in tech, and I get the impression that possibly a lot of people in this audience do. Um, and I've been hearing. Do, do people in this audience work in tech? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't think so. Um, I got, you're right. Good uh, guess. So I've been hearing a lot, especially recently, um, about this idea that um, the surveillance technologies that are used on the border increasingly are not being developed as government initiatives, but they're being developed in the private sector by big tech companies like Microsoft and Google, uh, Amazon, um, and then that technology is then being like marketed to or sold to the government for use in border surveillance. Um, and I've been hearing uh, like this hashtag tech won't build it, where tech workers are saying we will not participate in the construction of this, this technology because we don't trust 
uh, that it will be used responsibly. Um, so I guess I'm wondering like what y'all think about that, if you've seen developments of this. Um, so you think and, they like, got a dog in this fight? Well, and, and in particular, <laughs> what are things that tech workers in particular can do um, to, you know, to exert influence around these, these like, surveillance questions? Does somebody want to take a crack first, uh, or I can jump in? Well, I, I think they got a dog in this fight. I mean, yeah, I, would, you, would you expand on that? Sure. I, I was on a panel earlier today. Um, let's see. Where was I again earlier? I think it was asleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Cloud Act. Um, so they, you know, if we can go back to that, if I can, wait, 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 yeah. Um, Microsoft. Some double dealing with the government, perhaps. Might have a dog in this fight. Amazon. Um, I don't know if I can wrap my head around this, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I know a government, uh, government project. Of so, so, oh, yeah, so some of the tech companies, you know, they might have a dog in this fight and, and pr try to be our friends on, on the one side um, and might be getting paid for a lot of things on the other side. I don't know if I can really say that uh, and, you know, actually be able to argue that because I wouldn't know that, you know? But they, they might actually be um, creating some of these technologies um, just offhandedly. Um, so Amazon has gotten into the face recognition game and they should really get out of it, um, at least when it comes to marketing to the police, which they've been doing all over the country. Um, Certainly, uh, uh, there has. You know, we recently put out. Our executive director recently wrote a, a very well, you know, thought out long post, um, urging companies to um, know their customer, know your customer before you go and get involved with the police department or a federal agency or something like that. Do at least some research about their human rights record. You know, w w you know look at what are the dangers of what is going to be done with this technology, and. You know, if this is a bad actor, if this is an agency that has had repeated civil rights abuses, maybe don't do it. Maybe it's not worth it's not worth the money. Um, similarly, like we have also, and we'll actually have more on that in the coming weeks. Um, for you know, non Jeff Bezos level you know staff, uh, which Jeff, you, you hear? We we saved you a seat. No, okay. So for 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 you know other folks like. Even just like raising this issue with a manager, like bringing it up to middle manager, bringing it up a little bit of the chain and being like, this is, this is an issue. This is something I want to raise the current. Like we have to actually talk about this. We can't just like be like, well, we're all about the technology and not about the application of it. And starting those conversations within the culture of the company can actually have a huge effect. We've seen Google, you know, essentially drop out of, out of uh, you know, DOD AI research because of this. ICE has been a, a bit of a trickier one, but I think that like we look at like companies like Thomson Reuters getting involved in ICE, and I'd love to see more Thomson Reuters people, and even people on the journalism side of Thomson Reuters being like, it's kind of messed up for us to be doing journalism and feeding intelligence to you know ICE. Or I'm going to the International Association of Chiefs of Police conference uh, to gather information in October, and Uber has a giant like station in the middle of like the, the convention floor, and it's like, why does that have to be in your business model? Like, like, does it have to be in your business model? Is it that profitable, or is it just you know you're just looking for, you know, things to try? I, I'm not sure that fully answers your question. Like, it is like a very difficult issue in terms of like, you know, you know, you work for a boss, you do what the boss says. To what extent can you push back? Has anybody had any any experiences pushing back on these issues in your your workplace? You have. Do you want to do you want to say a little something about it? Can we, do we, where's the, where's the box at the moment? Can, it'll go right back to you, I, I swear. So I worked for a um, rather large uh, information security company and obviously we had customers that were uh, global. Some of them had better reputations than others. Um, and some of them, frankly, as, as engineers and uh, soft professionals, we were all like, we really don't want to have to support these people. Um, and there were times when we actually had to go as a group collectively to management and say, we're not going to support them. We don't agree with what they do. We're not going to offer them SOC services. We are not going to support them. You will have to find a way or find other engineers who will offer those services. Can we go to this uh, uh, 
uh, the Led Zeppelin shirt, and then I think that's we're out of time. Yeah. yeah. In China, I believe that there is a uh, citizen classification system, like good citizen, bad citizen. I suspect something like that's probably happening in, happening in the United States. Uh, so the government's going to have access to all the data they want. We all know that. But the interpretation of that data is probably more important than anything. What are we doing or you doing to find out how is the government building this profile on U.S. citizens? Again, good citizen, bad citizen. Where did you say you had this? In China. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. The credit so, rating or yeah, whatever. Yeah. One of the great things yeah. about about I mean, one of the it's not great. I'm not going to say it's great, but <laughs> one of the useful things uh, when it comes to the federal government is that when it, when you are going to do something that involves dealing with information on people, you have to issue various types of things like a privacy impact assessment. I'm on uh, DHS's like mailing list for this, so every time they issue one of these privacy impact assessments, I zip over it to see what the description of the program is, what they're, uh, you know, what they're saying they're going to do with the data, how long it's going to last. There, there's certain requirements that they have to spell out there, and that's always a place that I start to start looking at these things. Um, a lot of these agencies are very PR uh, conscious, and so you can't, really can't underestimate how, they will, how quickly they will backpedal for a news cycle. So I think that's all we have. Uh, I got the uh, the times up from Scott. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. This is great yeah, to see you such a turnout for this issue. Yeah.